terroir. Terroir. I'm going to learn what that word means, exactly how to pronounce it, and how it's affecting what I drink, as we have Rob Arnold on this episode of Texas Whiskey. It's like the little dog, right? Terrier. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this episode of Texas Whiskey. My name is Jimmy Hayes Nelson, a.k.a. Coach Jimmy, and I am your host as I am every week. And every week, as he always joins me to my right, is the doctor, Dr. Nico Martini. However, we have an actual real doctor sitting between me you. and you as well, Not as the- we have Dr. PhD doctor Rob Arnold on the show as well. Welcome, man. What, yeah, thank you. No, I can't. I can't really make you feel better though. Not that kind of doctor. What was it more difficult to get a PhD from Texas A and M than getting a nickname from Mad Mike in the old band you used to be in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna that's guess. how you got your doctorate. Yeah, that's, that's my doctorate. Gotcha. From Mad Mike. And I'm gonna disagree <laughs> that you're a doctor that can't make you feel any better. I uh, think if we're talking yeah. about drinking whiskey. I think there's some there's some additional qualities in that as yeah, well. Yeah, I can I can numb the pain. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Wow, we are off to a rip roaring start. Nico, would you like to pour us something and tell us what we're drinking? I, I, and then we're gonna find out more about what a doctorate in whiskey is. Yeah. So Rob, we start the show every every time we start the show, we do we pour a little whiskey. Um, today, I asked you if you'd had this because yep. this is a good old good old Texas whiskey. Um, if you want to oh, pass you that will. over to Mr. Jimmy. Um, kind of like a puff puff give situation. It really, yeah. it really is. That's a that's the show later. We have to do that one second because you can hold your liquor. But whoo, son! All right, what am I um, holding here, Nico? So this is Phoenix. Uh, wait, what is Phoenix, Phoenix Rising? Phoenix Rising yes. by Real Spirits. Real Spirits again, man. So, Nico yeah. has been on the Real Spirits train lately. I may have a man crush on Davin Topol. I, I think so. I, I'm 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 jealous of his whiskey and his uh, outdoor sportsmanship abilities. This says straight um, malt whiskey, batch one of four. So basically, the way that the way that this works is he finally Davin was finally able to talk them into. To letting him give give them a mash bill instead of just distill the beer, just just, just run the beer, and, and so he was able to finally give them a mash bill. Um, this is uh, this is an ongoing project. This is one. This is bottle one of four. Okay. So this is going to be released. This is two and a half years. It will also be released at three and a half years. It will be released at four and a half years, and uh, and I believe at five five and a half. Um, so so might, every I year they're going to have like eight a release from like the that, same yeah. barrels. Yes. Yes. Oh, interesting. Well, not, I'm not the same barrels. Okay. But the same. Um, the same whiskey aging process. So this and, one's two and a half. Uh, I believe this is two and a half. Yeah. Nice. He's got. There's a lot. I, man, I have you. Have you had much real spirits? No, I mean, yeah, I've visited them a couple times, cool. and but I haven't dove too deep into it. No. Man, just considering, like, I think. I've I've quickly kind of come to the come to the thought that that Davin man of of all people in Texas what he's making with the restrictions that he's been handed is unbelievable like he's it's he's he's completely handcuffed by by the brewery and you know he's he's benefited by the brewery sure. but, but you know he's he doesn't have a lot of he doesn't have a lot of say in what he's able to actually distill and so when because he's having used have to ha- having to use the mash bill that they give him because from the beer effectively is that okay? because i mean that's the idea right and the only reason the real spirits exist is because real ale wanted to have their beer distilled i totally get it yeah. this was not just out of nowhere like right. phoenix um this was this was something that was a very cognizant thing and so i totally understand where real spirits is coming from a real ales coming from but at the same time like man he's so good <laughs> he's so good at what he does so anyway that's awesome cheers cheers yeah, cheers and speaking of people that are so good at what they do how's that for a segue hey, there you go <laughs> rob thanks for uh, hanging out with us uh yeah, for course. people that don't know you will you give us a little background i know that as i did some research i know you and nico have been buddies now for a while i feel like most people that sit in that chair is my first time to meet them so as i do a little research and i i see former master distiller at tx and then i talk about the book so kind of give us your history of yeah. where this whole thing started well, as far as my Texas whiskey history, yeah, it was with TX. So right. I was the master distiller at TX for 10 years. Cool. Um, I was the first employee there back in 2011. Um, I was a, a 
PhD student at the time, not the one that I actually ever finished, but that was a, a biochemistry PhD, medical science. Wow. Was that uh, here in Texas? It was, yeah, it was at uh, UT Southwestern Medical uh -huh. Center in Dallas. And so, um, but in grad school, started making beer, started playing around with whiskey at home, you know, in the apartment. Right. Um, and uh, decided to, to make whiskey. And as a grad student that was 24, no clue how to raise money, no clue how to start a distillery. I was, you know, didn't know enough to the point where I was able to dive in, thinking that was I was going to pull all this off. And sure, while I was staying in school and finishing my PhD and being a, a medical scientist, and I figured I could just balance all this. That never right. was going to work. But was that was it just kind of a passion project, or are you like I think yeah, I want to do this kind of, for well, a it living? It's kind of like I'm going to start this on the side, this whiskey distillery. Sure, and then maybe one day it'll turn into something, something real. And but. Along that path, I was talking to developers in Fort Worth looking for a spot. Actually, speaking of using beer to make whiskey, I was talking to developers about what buildings next to the Rar Brewery mm. were available. And, right. I, and I knew Fritz and Aaron Rar, and they had, you know, kind of handshake agreement said, yeah, if you want to buy some of our beer and turn it into whiskey, go for it. And so... But through that process, that's so much less equipment than I. Yeah, buy. exactly. <laughs> right. Well, and I, I knew the Stranahan story right. where they were using uh, the brewery next door and when they started. But um, so I thought that would make perfect sense. And like you said, keep down the the need for equipment. Yeah. And but the developers told me there's these two guys doing the same thing or that want to make whiskey in Fort Worth, Leonard Firestone and Troy Robertson. And it's really close to the Raw Brewery here in Southside Fort Worth. And so I was like, okay, well, that means I've got competition. And so I was just online, found Leonard Firestone's Gmail, emailed him, and basically just said, look, I uh, know how to make whiskey. I don't know how to raise money. If you give me advice on how to raise money, I'll give you advice on how to Just a shot make, in the dark, just an yeah. unsolicited yeah. cold call via uh, Gmail. Via Gmail. As, as Which, opposed uh, to the, I'm coming for y'all. Right. <laughs> You're like, look, I could come for y'all, or we could do something together, and this yeah. may be a lot easier, right? And Leonard, and I've, I've never asked him this, maybe at this now that we're all past T, actually, maybe I should ask him, but I figured he just called me. He did end up calling me, and I figured it was just to make sure I wasn't an actual threat to where <laughs> right. I, I definitely wasn't. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, like, you know, but, uh, he's a kid with a side hustle. Yeah, yeah exactly. Days. But we started talking, and we all, you know, they kind of told me what they were looking to do, and I, I, it was very much aligned with a lot of what I, you know, the way I wanted to approach making whiskey in Texas, and they needed a distiller. Um, you know, Leonard and Troy both came from more business backgrounds, right. you know, Leonard was in television, Troy Oil and Gas, and so they didn't have a distiller yet and worked out. And at this well. part, like from the distilling part of things, were you just self taught? Is this just something you dove into, research, trial well, and error, or there was no yeah, like mentorship well, program or I mean from like from a theory standpoint and how to do it on a lab bench, mm -hmm. a lot of what I was doing in grad school at the time translated pretty much it almost translated perfectly. I mean, I was essentially in the lab at that time doing a form of mashing, a fermentation with bacteria, not yeast, but a form, a form of, you know, fermentation where you want the byproducts just like in whiskey, except with this, with my lab background, this was more about drug discovery, antibiotics that you wanted from what the bacteria were making during fermentation. But it all translated nicely. No doubt. But then I, we had Dave Pickerel. You would have made that connection. That <laughs> truly is Dr. Whiskey. Like, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. But no, I don't. UT Southwestern has an incredible distilling program. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> I did not say that. Unintentionally. <laughs> right. I'm going right. to get a phone call from you. Yeah, them. like, what? <laughs> that is not the mission of the school. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we had Dave Pickerel as our consultant. And oh, okay. So Very cool. He got the, you know, on the job training, and especially I learned this and the hard way to an extent, but that's the most important thing here is just experience on the floor. And, um, Luckily, really, you know, luckily Dave was our consultant, so I had a great experience learning from him. Coincidentally, Dave's first job in the industry in Kentucky was many, many years ago with my uncle's company. And oh, that, really? That was a company called Rotec that did, uh, they were kind of process engineers. They built distilleries. And so Dave's first job in the whiskey industry, the, the, the distilling industry, 
was with my uncle's company. So it was that's, kind of fun, full circle. You know. That's really cool. And I thought that was really interesting, the fact that you, you do have Kentucky ties. That's where you're from, correct? Yes, so I grew up in Kentucky. What part? Um, Louisville. So I grew oh, okay. up in Louisville, third generation member of the industry. So my uncle, my grandfather, my great uncles, they were all, for the most part, Brown Foreman employees. Um, the one exception would be my uncle, who left Brown Foreman to start this engineering firm. Um, we got cut my, well, how's this, my great aunt, married into a family the corcoran family who used to be copper still makers that would compete with vendome okay um uh, they they eventually went out of business but if you go to the, the jim beam visitor center in claremont their replica still inside the visitor center has the uh the plaque of the matt corcoran company copper copper works louisville kentucky that's so really they used cool. to be around and it was interesting. So, when I found out you were from Kentucky, I was like, okay, so I had to ask this. So my, my family's from the Paducah area. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, this whole idea since we've started the show of educating people about Texas whiskey, right? And primarily my family from Kentucky or anyone <laughs> from Kentucky or people that just have a very strong opinion about what Texas whiskey is or isn't yeah. versus that. So as you found your way in here, being from a, a Kentucky whiskey family, what was that opinion or feedback? Well, early on like a lot of people in the United States and, and beyond, and this has changed somewhat, but my family was confused because they were <laughs> like, you can't make bourbon in Texas. They were like, you have to make it in Kentucky. Even, even people that are in the industry, yeah. it was just such a, they were just, my mom especially, who wasn't in the industry, but just, um, you know, her and her entire family yeah, was. Her yeah, brother was. She was like, well, you can't do it in Texas. It's got to be made in Kentucky, right? And she was, and then she's like, well, you don't have the right water down there, even if the government says you can, you know? Right. <laughs> so, um, Which is so funny. We've talked about this multiple times on the show, that that was just fantastic marketing. Oh, yeah. About oh, yeah. bourbon God. only comes from, not even yeah. just whiskey in general, but bourbon specifically. It absolutely yeah. mattered. Because I grew up whiskey. thinking that as well, that it was, oh, yeah. oh bourbon has oh. to come from Kentucky. I, you can have other yeah. kinds of whiskey, you know? But yeah. I think but, if they could go back, 20 something years um, before, you know, they would, and if they could see what was going to happen, Kentucky, they might have pushed to make it a Kentucky thing and maybe just kind of grandfathered in MGP right there on the border, anyways. Right. So, because yeah. I, I just don't think back uh, it, it was that big of a deal to them at the time because there wasn't really bourbon made outside of Kentucky. Right. There they didn't look at anything as competition no, or we're going to like Virginia, trademark this yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Virginia yeah. Gentleman, uh, Seagram's or LDI, MGP, whatever you want to call it, they were, you know, making whiskey for wholesale and people were using it, but it just wasn't a problem. They're like, well, yeah, you could make it in California if you want, but that's not going to ever matter to us right. or Texas or anywhere else, you know? And so <laughs> I think it's interesting that, I mean, at this point, it's obviously way past that possibility to where they could ever make bourbon an only Kentucky thing. Yeah. But well, even you, when I was talking to my family, it wasn't even just bourbon, just the idea of Texas whiskey in general of like, wait, what is that? Yeah. And how is it different? And I know, and, and maybe this segues a little bit into talking about the book and, and just the differences in land and area and soil yep. and stuff between Kentucky. Was this, were you already interested in that piece of this before you had gotten here? Just as far as it, it started at the distillery, so this whole idea of, of local ingredients, um, how local ingredients can lead to distinct flavors that are actually specific to that place. There's all sorts of words you can connect to this idea. Um, provenance is one. Um, terroir is one that I've leaned towards. Sure. It's taken from the wine industry, although wine is not the only one that will use it. You know, it's. It, it's there in coffee and cheese and it's debated in this, in, in these industries, but the word is most, it's definitely most tightly associated or championed by the wine industry. Um, but it, the idea is all around where do the ingredients come from mm -hmm. in the wine industry, terroir or terroir is the way the French would say right. it, but I'm not French. So I'm going to say we should terroir. Text it up yeah. a little bit. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, you know, there it's just about the grapes. Um, I think would be what most winemakers would agree was that we're talking when terroir it's about the grapes it's about the vineyard and the variety and the interplay of the environment on the vineyard with the grape variety so the grapes more so than the soil or the well, the way the, the environmental conditions in the vineyard impact the flavors that you actually coax out of the grape so sure. yeah the soil conditions are a part of the environment climate so the climate yep. so is the topography so is the microflora, you know, the microorganisms that yeah. live um, and the and the bugs and everything else that's living on that vineyard. All of that can influence the way a variety expresses its traits. And some of that some of those traits could be flavor. Gotcha. Um, so the same thing could, uh, could happen in grain, too. And it does happen in grain. 
Um, but I didn't get into this whole idea through grain. It was actually through yeast. So when I first joined TX, um, our Firestone and Robertson, um, and just, yeah, for not to be confusing here, but Firestone and Robertson Distilling Company was the company name and TX Whiskey was the brand. The brand, right. But and most it, people it, now it, know it, TX, it, right? It just because it blew up. TX. Sure. Especially after Pernod Ricard acquired the company in 2019, it really just kind of moved to us saying TX. Fantastic but, um, marketing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But um, my first job with, with Troy and Leonard was to go isolate a wild Texas yeast strain. Was that your idea? No, it wasn't. It was it was their idea. Okay. So they had been to Kentucky well, it, it was their idea to do that. Now, the idea s- goes way back to the way that Kentucky, Tennessee, the old-time distillers would find yeast. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you go to Kentucky or Tennessee or any of the old heritage brands that are still around, a lot of them, to, maybe all of them, have proprietary yeast strains that were isolated by their founders, their whiskey makers, someone in the company's history a lot of it stretches back before Prohibition. Um, the, some of the more recent ones were right after Prohibition. So when Prohibition ended, Jim Beam, like the Jim Beam, mm-hmm. one of the first things he did was go catch a wild yeast off his back porch that is still, the at least the, that mother strain. Um, it's drifted some, surely, since then, but that is the strain that's still used That started today. it all, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's still used by the distillery. They had one before Prohibition. It, they lost it during Prohibition. So... I mean, it used to be so important that distillers were known as um, not really master distillers, but distillers and yeast makers because it was so critical to the process. So Troy and Leonard had been to Kentucky and Tennessee and visited these old distilleries that all were, you know, to some extent telling the story of their wild yeast. And um, they wanted one. They wanted one for their Texas distillery. And so that was actually one of the things they asked me in my interview was can you isolate a wild Texas yeast? And you know, I didn't really know. I wanted the job. Sounds I, like I, a big game I hunt said to me. Yes. When you say <laughs> yeah, yes, you're like, and then you yeah, go to the internet, figure and it, and it out, leave. right? Yeah. But this is where my school. You know, I was working with marine bacteria um, in grad school at the time. Essentially, I was isolating marine bacteria from ocean sediment um, and and finding ways to identify what they were at the species level, and then grow them. And so luckily microbiology, uh, for the most part, a lot of these techniques apply to different species and even, <laughs> you know, get outside bacteria and go into, into fungi, go into yeast. And so the same techniques I could use to go isolate a wild yeast strain. And so that's what we did. And I spent about six months when I first joined the company on this wild yeast hunt project. And, right. Um, we got, uh, the, the most success came when I went to this ranch in Glen Rose, <clears throat> which was 45 minutes from the distillery mm-hmm. from downtown Fort Worth where that first distillery was. And when I was in, in Glen Rose, there was this really awesome ranch that um, a friend of the company owned. And so they let me, um, the ranch manager let me just sample the ranch all day. I was there to pick up this really cool copper pot, you know, five gallon still to, to play around on. But when I got down there, I was like, this is like such an amazing piece of land. Can I just, take samples. And so I just all day took samples of fruits and nuts and seeds and soil samples and bark samples. Uh, TCU gave me some lab space to do some work, had some help from one of the professors there, um, Dean Williams. And we uh, isolated a hundred or so different types of yeast from this ranch. And from there, we narrowed it down to the, uh, we we used a really simple, this sounds complicated, but a really simple DNA sequencing technique um, based on PCR. So based on all these people now know that word a lot more because uh-huh. of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> right. same same technology used to do, um, you know, the non-rapid test, the, the yeah. one that everyone thinks, you know, the, the better one, I guess. But um, same type of technology. It's not hard to do. And we could narrow it down to 10 to 11, something like that. It was a while ago that were the right species from this ranch because we, we want to work with a species called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, bread yeast, ale yeast, wine yeast. It's just the species name. Mm-hmm. Um, the Latin name is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then once we found those 10 or so isolates that were the right species, it was just doing small-scale fermentations, small scale distillation, sensory analysis, and ended up picking one in a blind taste test um, against some commercial strains. And so that one that we chose became the proprietary wild yeast that TX is used to make TX bourbon, 
all of its expressions, mm -hmm. and also TX Rye, which hasn't come out yet. Um, Very cool. Since 2000, uh, 2012, I guess. Okay, so listening to you with this, and just going back to conversations you and I have had when this conversation comes up, why do you feel like in the wine industry this is so readily just accepted, but it sounds like it's super debated in maybe not just even whiskey, but the spirits about, okay, the land and the soil and all of the climate, like this all impacts the way things taste. Why do you feel like there's this big debate pushback in this industry and it's pretty much just accepted with wine? Yeah. It's the distilling. I mean, it's, it's the, it's the production. It's the actual production of it because, because I mean, with wine, there's, you, you stop at a point like mm -hmm. you do, you, you do not, you don't distill wine. It right. Brandy. Um, and so, much, much more of the actual flavor is going to come down to the grapes and where they came. Like all of sure. everything that terroir is, it's, is, it's so much easier to discern in wine than it is in whiskey. Like I, I can't, so we, we just, we just did a, a chat for American whiskey mm -hmm. and um, the, I think the, the next, the next edition, I think it's coming out in a couple have months. A copy of it here. Yes. It'll be in there. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the, after, after we got done, I was kind of reading back through there and, you know, editing and whatever. I just kept, the thing that kept striking me was this whiskey has to be the biggest pain in the ass to study. <laughs> because of the sheer amount of variable, like yeah, I mean, I mean, like I li literally, I have Grayson one and Grayson one B because of the variables, but it's the same whiskey, right. but it's not even remotely the Close, same whiskey. Right. Yeah. And so, like, it's there's so much, so many layers that are just on top of what people think of. Terroir. Right. So like, you know, where, because what you're, you're going to distill it. What happened? Then you're going to put it in a thing. What's the thing? Where's the thing? Right. How long was it in the thing? What's the climate what, what was that the climate you put the thing? thing in the, yeah. What, what did was you the do climate the thing in the rickhouse? You, you put the thing put in, in, right. The thing, and then where did the thing come from? Where was it made yeah. and where did it dry? And where did, like, it's just so much, so much. But if you, so if you just look at the three ingredients, yeast, grain, and oak, and terroir usually, if you want to be very serious, you know, very, I guess, constrained with how you want to approach the idea, it would be with the grain. But, and if you just want to think, that's the way the winemakers would think about it too with the grapes for the most part. Sure. So what is it exactly? It's essentially a romantic synonym for nature and nurture. Nature is the DNA that any organism is born with, and nurture is how the environment impacts the way that DNA is expressed and therefore mm -hmm. the traits that are produced, which can be flavor, sure. like we talked about. And so any of the three ingredients are going to be influenced by nature and nurture, by the DNA and the environment. So if I, I've kind of, in the book, and so I, I did write a book called The Terroir of Whiskey. In that book, I make a statement that I think terroir should only apply to the grain. And my argument there came down more to, to me, terroir has this innate human element that is really tied to agriculture. And we're not farming yeast or oak trees but the way the farmers interact with the crop is where I think, to me, that that's an important aspect of terroir. But I can I can walk that back. I mean, I can I can understand because honestly, this debate has to a, to a point. I'm a little tired of trying to say, well, terroir is a part of the bigger picture. Like right. maybe terroir is just the conductor that we can say, well, every single one of our ingredients has DNA and it's influenced by the way the environment. Um, that it grows in or thrives in, however you want to think about it. So, but you're right. Like, how do you, why is this so debated here versus wine? Well, in wine, it, it does on the surface look way less manufactured. And this is one of the things that people that are not friends of terroir and whiskey yeah. say, well, it's too manufactured. Sure. Um, too far removed from by the time what yeah, that impact was. Distillation will cover up or destroy or whatever. The barrel is going to cover mm -hmm. up any nuances from terroir. But like, even proving that one is well, first off the compounds that we the flavor compounds that come from the grain that come from fermentation they're not destroyed during distillation they're manipulated sometimes but not always and they're definitely concentrated but you're not destroying we're not like we're not cracking the atom like I right right um so any kind of nuances that are due to um terroir due to nature and nurture of our ingredients like they're going to translate through to the final product but it's really hard to to pinpoint what exactly is going on. And that's where you're right. Like trying to study this at a scientific level is really, really difficult because there are so many variables. So I've like, my approach early on was very reductionist to whiskey making and it didn't really work very well, to be honest. Like 
you have to, to me, the, the better way to think about this is the more variability we can explore in our ingredients, the more we can not go down the commodity route, the more we try to push the flavor possibilities in our ingredients, the more we're going to discover in the end product. We don't have to actually know exactly where all the flavors came from. Yeah. It's just that we can chase them and discover them. And if we don't try, if we don't, if we don't move past some of these commodity ingredients, then we'll, we'll never know what could be out there. Well, because when this topic first came up, when Nico and I started the show, as I was just trying to educate myself, was the and this is kind of what you and I were messaging about as we prepped for the show, was this idea when people, going back to, let's go, Kentucky family, when somebody's like, oh, I don't like Texas whiskey, or Texas whiskey sucks, or if it's not from Kentucky, it's whatever. And Nico's always made this great point comparing things to, to scotch and how that scotch inside of Scotland really depends on the area it came from, and then you can stick eight Scotlands or whatever inside of Texas. So, like, when I think of this argument, I, I, that's exactly where my brain went is, okay, somebody says, I either do or don't like Texas whiskey. My first thought was, okay, what did you have, and where was it from? And do you feel yeah. like this like this whole concept has to play into that as well, correct? Yeah, it does. I think that where this concept will really shine through in a good way and it'll be as more of our whiskeys come of age is that you're going to have a diversity of flavor within Texas whiskeys that's that's very prominent and creates flavors that that don't align with Kentucky mm -hmm. and that really set us apart. I think where a lot of this early on it wasn't just Texas, it was craft whiskey. I think where a lot of this like I don't like Texas whiskey was people saying I don't like craft whiskey. And that, that happened in more places than here. I think a lot of that was just more due to our lack of experience and maybe using some of the wrong equipment or equipment that was different than what they were used to tasting. Like I, I still think one of the biggest reasons a lot of craft whiskeys taste different than Kentucky bourbon or Tennessee whiskey is that most of these craft producers have been running pot stills, pot hybrid, you know, these these pot column hybrids that Vendome produced that are they're fine stills, but they make you could you, you're not going to make a distill at the taste like what comes off of a beer still and right. beer stills are what are used in most of the distilleries in Kentucky and Tennessee. And so I think that is what's early on. You had this lack of experience. You had these different pieces of equipment and you just had these really unique whiskeys that were so different than what they were used to tasting yeah. in their mainstream Kentucky bourbons. They and just that, didn't know what to think about it. Well, that's exactly what, you know, learning from Nico and as I've educated myself and the conversation I've been having with my families or anybody that's just like, this is what I love from Kentucky. I'm like, and specifically, as this continues to mature, it's cool. Texas isn't trying to taste like yeah. Kentucky. It's that, you know, if we go back to the wine analogy, it's, okay, I'm, if I'm having an Argent, a wine from Argentina, I'm not trying to taste like a French Bordeaux. It's yeah, going yeah. to be different. And I think that's if people are saying, oh, whiskey is supposed to taste like this in this little box, which is this Kentucky bourbon or whatever, that's probably where the pushback comes from as far as here is a different way to make this with a different flavor profile. The Argentina thing is actually a really, a really good example. Like the like Malbec came from France, and then they started planting it in Argentina. Right. There is not a Malbec from Argentina that tastes like a Malbec from France right. at all. And they're using the same grape. Right, because it's in a different it's a area. a completely right. different area. And, um, yeah, just the, the, the fact, the, the thing that kind of, the, the thing that kind of strikes me the most about it and, um, was, was kind of the sort of resolution or at least the way that I cut the interview of our interview yeah. was, um, was the fact that if we don't pay attention to this, it's going to disappear. And, you know, like it, it goes, it goes back to being, to, to, to getting away from the commodity thing. And, um, and I mean, the simple fact is the, the only reason that bourbon exists at all is because farmers had to figure out a way to sell corn like six months later, like <laughs> right. nine months. We can't just keep growing the corn and then feeding what we, and then we eat a bunch and then what, what the hell are we going to do with that corn? <laughs> right. Like we need to grow less or grow different or like figure something out to right. do with it. Let's turn it. Yeah. Into let's monetize this extra yeah. stuff. Right. It, exactly. And when you do that, like. All of the whiskey was craft at the beginning because right. it was literally, oh, that's from John. Oh, that's from Rick. Right. Oh, that's from Dave. Like, you know, this sure. way, Exactly. And John, Rick, and Dave's whiskey all probably tasted different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they were all using their own heirloom varieties of corn. They didn't call them heirlooms. That was just their variety. Yeah, that's it was how, just corn. That's how varieties right. varieties existed back <laughs> exactly. then. Exactly. There was no such thing as a commodity grain market or modern plant breeding. So you had all those unique aspects in a whiskey because... Yeah, it was just the only way to do it. You know, it's 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 the when 
when business starts getting involved in in food, it's it's just sort of. I mean, if you take a step back, you kind of look. You know, you know it. Everybody knows it, whether they want to admit it or not. The way that you're going to make money is making the same thing over and over, faster and faster, more and more and more, and then get everything else out of the way because it's not that thing. Let's focus on that thing because that thing is the cheapest, the fastest. Let's do it the best. Keep go, 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 and then everything else falls by the wayside, mm-hmm. and bloody butcher corn doesn't didn't win, and purple corn didn't win, and green Oaxacan didn't, which I don't know is an actual corn, but it didn't win. Right. Uh, but like those are the things that didn't win the commodity game. Yellow Dent did, and that's fine. But like now, so now Yellow Dent wins. All the farmers making Yellow Dent, and then it, it time kind of goes on, and now all of a sudden the people that want to keep making whiskey, they don't want to farm anymore. They just want to make whiskey because now <laughs> that's what we do. And so what's for sale? Yellow Dent. Yeah, because there's the most of it. Yeah, because right. that's what the farmers are making. Yeah. Because that's what everybody's buying. And so, I mean, what, man, what percentage do you think is the, the, um, the distilling industry as a whole? What percentage do you think they buy of like the corn? Oh, <laughs> like I, a, maybe a percent or two. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, really? maybe, maybe a little bit more. It's, it's very minimal compared to the, to the market itself, but that's why distillers, at least since prohibition have, then, oh, well, what's the commodity market going to provide? Well, it's these modern varieties that are built for yield, that are not built for flavor. Um, Fertilized. That's what's there. Yeah. yeah, farmed in an industrial way. So, I mean, is, you know, you look at um, where this could go on the grain side specifically and what terroir could do. If, if, you, if you're going to authentically pursue this idea of how do I capture flavor that's specific to where I am, that's specific to the farm, then you need to one have a farmer or farmers on your on your side that you can team up with that can grow your grains for you, and then you need to be proactive about what types of varieties are they, are they going to actually plant and work with them and pay them because they're growing that with the end product in mind, not yeah, just exactly. what's left over yeah. and now I'm going to make whiskey out of whatever's left over. It's like right. oh, yeah. I think I I'm sure we've had multiple guests that we've talked to this, but what stands out to me was the Iron Root episode. We were talking all these different corns and heirloom and it was like really specific yeah. corns you know that i hadn't heard of before and it was that same idea of oh no we picked this because we know where we want this to go not because like you just said there was a surplus and we decided to do something with it but at it. the same time with iron root as far as like they have an idea of where they want it to go that's uh, they're still they're still small enough and i guess the craft distiller is still small enough in general that they are um, they're flexible. Like they, 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 they are able to make changes sure. on a, on a smaller scale when you're not, when you're, when you're not like, all right, let's, let's get, let's get the hundred thousand cases out this month. Then it's, you know, you can do things that, um, you can kind of take these different elements, go, go to different places with them on the production level. And then when it comes back to time, time to like, make the whiskey whatever the whiskey is going to be now if you've done it in a conscious way you have an entire world of colors for you to paint your Mm -hmm. paint your painting as opposed to these three really solid primary colors you can do a hell of a lot with primary colors but man if you have all of them yeah like yeah that's the big crayon box yeah it's (laughs) it's different it's a different level so rob like you said you know obviously you're not with tx anymore you wrote the book like what's your function now are you working with like do other distillers bring you in for your expertise or kind of where where are you where where's your road now with what you're doing with this and championing you know this terroir champion the, the terroir you know yeah you know, you, you know the fact that you're like look this matters yeah. you're in an education process is so where that do you, not enough for you i don't know <laughs> does just, he need to be doing more he doesn't stuff? nope the answer could have been like nope i wrote a book and i drink whiskey and i talk on podcasts and the answer's fine yeah, like yeah. i was just asking no, there's I, so much defending <laughs> the terroir needs yeah. we hey, need that, a, a champion job let right. him be our All champion right. <laughs> yeah they uh no, I, I left TX back in October of last year, October of 21. Um, just it was time for me to move on sure. to new ventures. And um, part of it is to focus on more writing. But a lot of it was just uh, to take a step back for a second. Sure. Um, the team at TX is 
ready to go. Yeah. Um, they didn't need me necessarily to, to move forward. And so you felt you left them all in good hands and everybody yeah, was show was the, the blender there. Evan Brewer is the, um, you know, I call him master blender, master distiller, Evan Brewer's master distiller. Ali show was master blender. Uh, Craig Blair, um, doesn't have the master title, I guess, but he's, um, high up on their blending and, and sensory side. I mean, they've got a great team there. Um, I am working on some new projects. Um, one in particular that I think the closest way to describe this is a uh, like a venture firm for early stage whiskey companies. Cool. Um, I'll be able to, and I'll still be a distiller through this company in a yeah. way, just not for my own brands. But um, we just uh, I'll be able to open up more about that here not too long. But um, yeah, we're we're actively working on it. Have you, have you thought and just kind of in in the step back trying to think about just. Uh, different different directions have you have you thought about sort of taking this the concept of tawar and, and moving it into i don't even know if it's a concept of tawar, maybe who knows um but 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 essentially kind of giving barrels the same treatment as you did the grain giving location and humidity and yeah. and whatever barometric pressure the same mm. treatment as you kind of did with grain i'm I mean, Does that question make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The well, this is where I do think, and I, I actually want to walk back a bit from what I put in the book. And I, <laughs> the book maybe you should just say the terroir of whiskey. Isn't it funny when you write a book and then yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. I, I didn't mean half of that. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, maybe it's cause, maybe it's why there's it, different volumes, right? There's I, like the, I sure meant it when I wrote well, it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also trying to convince Columbia Press to let me do you know a yeast version and an oak version. So sure, maybe that's yeah. why I'm walking back yeah. on it. But maybe it's the terroir of whiskey grain is that is that version, but. Um, I think this idea applies to the yeast and to the oak, and there's no reason that we shouldn't approach all three of our ingredients in this way. I mean, with, with the barrel, given where the oak trees have to come from, it's, you're not as flexible as to where you can, you know, really study some of these in the same way you do on where does the grain come from. Yeah. But with the oak, I mean, you could ship your staves to be seasoned at your distillery, you know, let them season on site for a year, two years. The, the microflora, the indigenous microflora, the microbes that are in the air at your distillery are going to play a big role in how that oak seasons and therefore the flavors you get from it. I mean, that's a way you're pursuing something local, <laughs> there's, right? There's so much. Well, what yeah. about the forest that they grew in? Well, what yeah, about well, how, what was the elevation of the yeah. forest that they well, grew in? Well, I keep going in? back to the, my dry? next other question was going to be water. <laughs> along, like you yeah. go down the water like rabbit hole as well, well right? Uh, whiskey is such a pain in the ass yeah. to study. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. But if we if we don't get too concerned about trying to overscience it. And I I'm like this is I mean, I've overscienced it. Right. Like no other. That's your playground. So maybe dude. <laughs> maybe I need to like have a talk to myself in the mirror. But if we don't try to overscience it, and you just think about ways to explore, like what hasn't been done yet, and don't don't worry too much about the flavor chemistry at first. You know, if you want to dive in to really study that, so that because if let's say you end up with some flavor you love and you don't want to lose it, well then maybe you should do some work to understand what is. What, what chemistry is driving that? Why does that? it taste like it And tastes? how do I not lose that? And it's sure. there are there's technologies out there. Um, we kind of know the most important 30 to 40 compounds in a glass of whiskey, flavor compounds. What's really important is not so much which compounds are there because they're almost always there. Um, what's more important is the concentration that they're there in. And, but either way, if you don't get too, over, too hung up on what exactly happened and just if you, if you explore some of these ideas... Um, and to me, the basic way to do that is to break away from commodities, like mm -hmm. whether it's commodity grain, commodity barrels, commodity commercial yeast, like just, okay, I know I can go buy it off the shelf and maybe that's a good way to start my, my brand or, or a safe way to do that. Um, but it move past that. Like what else is out there? Because there's only like maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 commercial active dry yeast out there or something. I don't know what it is for whiskey. It's not very many. They're all pretty similar. Mm -hmm. There's so much out there with with yeast and move beyond yeast into bacteria that you can use in fermentation like again if you just if you don't get too hung up on what exactly is happening then there's just still a lot to discover I mean, some of these whiskeys that we're making in texas are good examples of that where people haven't just gone straight to commodities and exp they're discovering these really cool flavors it's not like we've never tasted these flavors before it's just they're there it, they're there at different intensities sure. than we're used to you know like oh yeah there's a ton of blackberry in that whiskey or a ton of cinnamon like there's cinnamon all over kentucky bourbon that doesn't mean that the compounds are different but the concentrations the experience is different and so that 
and, and the stories behind them are different. Yeah. It's man, it's the scale. Like the, the the thing that I keep coming back to every time I think about it is the difference between Kentucky and Texas for the most part. It all kind of comes down to scale. And the people that are the most of the people that are making whiskey in Kentucky, it's a massive scale. Mm-hmm. And so when you you worked at the largest Texas distillery. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you're saying all of this, everything that you just said for 45 minutes. Like, yep. this is what was at the largest distillery in Texas. Texas, right. As opposed to, you know, Kentucky. And, yeah. uh, like, there, and there's, there is nothing wrong with Kentucky. Bourbon is delicious. Right. But at the same time, they're just, it's, it's turning the Titanic, man. If you want to make a change, yeah, like you can't. You can't be. You can't be malleable to, just depending on your situation. Sure. And I think that's the other thing that's just really cool: the the different experimentation and things that can be done. And from the very beginning of show number one, when Nico and I set this up, he was like, "The cool thing about Texas is that it's only been around for 14, 15 years, and we don't have a thing yet, so we get to try a lot of." Things you know, yeah. and and, and it, there is a variety. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody walking into Heaven Hill going, "We're switching corn"? <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> what? Like what? Is that like a stop the presses moment <laughs> where all like the gears and everything all shoot yeah. off? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there, I, I think that they're even in Kentucky though. I think you'll in Tennessee or these other massive look. You know, where there's massive distilleries. In hindsight, you don't need that much land to even sustain what they need for a year compared mm-hmm. to what. Yeah. A, what land is already farmed in Kentucky or Tennessee and what land is already farmed for corn and, and wheat. Uh, and they're trying to bring rye back, but it's just, it's just going to be shifting the mindset some. And there, I think it's happening. I think it's happening in the background. I think it'll continue to happen. The, the big difference between this and wine growing is that, you know, the grapes are harvested once a year and crushed and, turn into juice. Well, here it's harvested once a year and then put into a silo. So that, that's right. a big difference that's going to have to be overcome, which is really just an investment. The silos exist. There's You don't need that big of a silo, but you need a big one. Uh, but they exist. It's just putting the money behind the grain handling infrastructure to where you have more control over your raw ingredient. To me, there's a great flavor exploration project here. Don't get me wrong, but it's also more about, it's just as much about the farmer being paid fairly, the environment being sustained through mm-hmm. this. You know, right now, if we're sourcing from the commodity market, we're to an extent putting a blind eye to where our raw ingredients coming from and how sustainable is it actually grown. Because right. the commodity grain system is not, it's not known for being the, the most sustainable. Sustainable, right. Um, it's largely industrial, you know, a lot of industrial farming goes into that and doesn't always mean that's a bad thing. Conventional farming can be done in a good way, but a lot of it is, you know, high high input conventional farming. That usually isn't isn't good. Holy smokes! That's well, gr- ho- yes. hopefully this version of the podcast interview that you keep repeatedly doing was a little bit more entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or a little different routes as well. So let people know where can they get the book. Oh, the book's available on um, you know Amazon or any you know I don't know what local bookstores have it, but I would you know if you have one that you like, go into the local bookstore and ask them to bring it in because awesome that uh, doesn't Cause doesn't, that doesn't matter doesn't really matter for me that much. But sure, I like to see it in. A, Is there a, a best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, my. Well, my Instagram. You don't have is, to give out your address or anything. I'm not trying to like yeah, get yeah. stalkers well, no, no, here. No, well, <laughs> well, I'm trying to think that I changed my Instagram after I left TX. So now it's um, at, I think it's at Dr. Rob Arnold. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to have to look you yeah. up. <laughs> right. Uh, like dr. It is dr. Rob Arnold. Dr. Rob Arnold. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, well, I love what you're doing. Like I said, as, as someone from the. Outside the whiskey nerd bubble, this is super interesting. I mean, yeah. the opportunity to continue to be educated. So we yeah. appreciate you taking the time the book is to awesome. come in. The book is awesome. Cool. And then where so y'all just did an interview, and where's that interview going to be? Uh, it's going to be in American Whiskey Magazine. Awesome. Yep. Check that out. You can get the book, American Whiskey Magazine. Check out the article uh, for Rob, for Dr. Other Dr. Nico fake Martini. Doctor. Fake, fake doctor. Fake doctor Martini. Nico Martini. <laughs> My name is Coach Jimmy Nelson. Until next time, guys. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Cheers.
Yeah. <laughs>